I'm Mary Gallagher. I'm the director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. I'm really excited to introduce Scott Tong, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about his journalistic career. Um, he has been reporting in over a dozen countries uh, as a correspondent for Marketplace, from yep, refugee camps in East Africa to shoe factories in Eastern China. He toured the oil sands of Canada and snuck into Burma. Uh, and he currently serves as correspondent for Market Marketplace's sustainability desk, where he covers uh, energy, the environment, natural resources, and the global economy. He joined Marketplace in 2004. And in 2006, he opened Market Marketplace's first permanent bureau in China as Shanghai bureau chief. And in 2013 and 2014, Scott was uh, here at uh, University of Michigan as a Knight Wallace fel uh, journalism fellow. And uh, we were just talking about it. That was the last super cold winter. So Scott enjoyed that. That's he's right. getting more snow tomorrow. Back to old times. Yeah. And uh, he's also reported on uh, the globalization backlash of last year, Venezuela's economic collapse, the challenge of long-term job creation in the United States, the 2011 Japan tsunami and recovery, and the 2011 famine in the Horn of Africa. Today, he's going to be talking about his new book, A Village With My Name, A Family History of China's Opening to the World. It was just published by University of Chicago Press at 20, in 2017. And uh, he's also giving a book reading tonight at Literati, not that I want anyone to leave this talk, um, where you can actually purchase the book. And this is a personal journalistic discovery of China's long and interrupted economic opening. More than a faraway story from a long time ago, it addresses the many divisive questions about globalization and drawbridges that many countries are debating today. So please join me in welcoming Scott Tong. Thank you. Well, thank you to Mary and the Center and to the Knight Wallace Journalism Fellows Program for, uh, for having me back. Uh, I'm going to you know, talk some about uh, the book I've been working on, but Michigan really has a central place in the, uh, in the process of how the idea kind of turned into this, into this product. Um, uh, when I came in 2013 as a, as a Knight Wallace Fellow, I had a book proposal and I was shopping it around and trying to uh, test my idea with folks. And so uh, wh whoever was around and willing to talk to me about it, uh, I, I, uh, so there are a lot of people who, who have a hand in this, uh, in this product, just a couple of them. Uh, a lot of them aren't, aren't here, unfortunately, but I've certainly thanked them individually, you know, when I was thinking about this kind of longer story and how some of my family history connected with the larger story, Per Castle uh, said I was onto something and he said, you know, you, you, you need to think about history in a little bit of a different way. Uh, Linda Lim at, at, at the university said, you know, don't, don't go too hardcore into the academics, you can just tell your story and leave the academics to us, the academics. Um, uh, uh, Charles Bright, the historian, reminded me that globalization is not a new story, um, and it doesn't always go one way, which I'd assume for much of my adult life. Uh, Wang Zheng contextualized the life of my grandmother, who, uh, uh, who went to a school run by American missionaries in China 100 years ago, and Travis Holland in the writing program said, well, keep your eye as you're writing on the central tension in the story, and revise, and revise two more times after that. So uh, there's a lot of Michigan in this, uh, in this book, so the university deserves a bit of a cut. So as soon as I start to make money, uh, I will send it over. Uh, to, uh, so, so thank you to, to Mary and the university for, for having me. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be in front of uh, people who are, are interested in the radio business who spend a lot of time in a soundproof room where there's nobody else next to you. Um, and, and we just talking to a microphone, and one of the first pieces of advice I got was uh, from uh, Phil Ponce at WTDW Chicago Public Television. He said, well, you have to imagine you're talking to somebody, because usually you're, we're, we're not. And you have to assume you're speaking to somebody who is interested in everything you say, <laughs> as if that person exists. Um, uh, so that's what we usually do, and now we get to interact with folks. So, so I do want to uh, leave a lot of time for your questions if you have any, and uh, would love to kind of interact and talk more about the process, uh, the, the research, kind of broader takeaways, how I think a little bit differently about China. There are, uh, you know, at least a couple haters of the book who have given me strong feedback, and happy to talk about that as, as well. So, um, so the book is, uh, you know, tries to 
assist in telling the long story of how China opened up to the world through the lives of five people across five generations in my family tree. But I'm, I'm not going to kind of go chapter and verse into my family history. It, you know, it's not that interesting. Um, but uh, what the book tries to do and what I'm going to try to do here is you know, tell a few action stories and stories of me trying to find uh, information and go back into family past and kind of draw larger lessons that are relevant to, uh, relevant to today. Um, and I'll, I'll end with some kind of broader observations and again, leave some time for, for your questions. So um, I want to ask you how many of you, maybe this will be everyone in the room, has been to China before? So just about everyone here, right? And, and how, how many of you have, have actually gone up to, uh, when, when I, soon after I moved there in 2006, you know, the building that's, that looks like the bottle opener opened up. How many of you have been up that building, the World Financial Center? Uh, yeah. So when I first got there, I met a, a banker who'd been uh, working in China and many other countries for several years. And he said, you know, what happens to people like you, kind of new people here, is the first thing you get is you get skyscraper syndrome. And China fools you uh, because you kind of think that this is what, what the real story is. And, um, and he was right. I think what happens is when you go and kind of look at uh, these you know, great big shiny things and fancy cities, you, it, everything is new. And, and the distorted view is, is you think China is, is, is a new story that it's kind of newly constructed and newly built, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that, that it's instant China. And I think um, there are a lot of these kind of bumper stickers we use, certainly journalists and others who are trying to tell in a short amount of time a complicated story. We use these kind of bumper sticker slogans and certainly uh, uh, instant China is one of them. Today, I live in Washington, D.C., where people are paid a lot of money to speak with great certainty and they talk a lot about muscular China, or in another context, they'll talk about slowing China, or uh, over-leveraged China, or polluted China. They all kind of tell a little bit of the story, but not the whole thing. Um, but I think instant China has a lot of constituency um, inside and outside of China. As you know, um, often if you just kind of speak to somebody about their life story in, in China, um, very often it begins in the 1980s. Right, with their with their reform and opening, and and it kind of goes goes back to there. Most reporters, and I was one of those, right? They they go to China and and they tell one of those stories of someone whose life dramatically changed because it's a great narrative. It's an important part of the story. So when I uh, first reported there in 2005, and and we did a marketplace, uh, the program I worked for, did a special out of uh, Chongqing in in southwestern China, and I profiled one of these porters. You know, people who carries a, a big, thick bamboo stick around and gets paid to, uh, to, to carry everything from you know, kind of small refrigerators to big suitcases people have, all kinds of things. And, and it's a remarkable story. The, the man I profiled, his name is Mr. Xu. And he lived in, you know, what you and I would consider kind of squalid conditions in the city. It's a great migration story. And then... Um, you know, look down, kind of an invisible person in the city uh, of, of, you know, tens of millions of people. And then he took me back to his village, which actually happens to be Deng Xiaoping's village, too. And uh, he went back, and he was transformed into kind of big man on campus when he went back, right? He was the man who went to the big city and made good. And the thing I remember about, mo mo the one anecdote I remember about reporting that story was when he took me back to his neighbor's house, and his neighbor has this gigantic wok. And I said, that's the biggest kind of cooking wok I've ever seen. And Mr. Shu comes back and he says, mine's bigger. Um, and and it, so that, that story, you know, is a people's lives kind of change in, in an instant. And it happens very, happens very quickly. Um, kind of the Big Bang version of the story. And when I, uh, and as, as a reporter, when you're there, you're often telling these stories of what's happening right now, and it's challenging to contextualize it, or in a newspaper article, or even a long kind of feature on the radio, you can kind of tell a little bit of the backstory just to, to something happening in the financial markets, or kind of the macroeconomic data, or something, but not a lot. So I moved back to the States in 2010, 
And when I came back, I, I didn't have a, a kind of a satisfactory sense of what the longer uh, what the longer story was. And so I started on this very long overdue process of working on this book. And I suspected that some of the story would be told through some of the members of my family who I'd heard of. You know, some family members uh, in the family tree whose, whose stories were considered more notable, they'd been talked about a lot, and others, others including my maternal grandfather, their lives were never mentioned uh, at, at the table. So I wanted to investigate that, and I had a feeling um, that, that their lives were part of the uh, were, were part of this story. So uh, in the case of my family, um, the first mover out of the village, uh, the Tong family village, my surname in Chinese is very unusual. It means child. And um, uh, in the Tong family village, where everyone's surname is the same, uh, my great-grandfather uh, was the first mover. Um, so my father and I, uh, in 2009, we went to try to go find the village and to see if it was still there, because as you know, a lot of the villages in China are, are shrinking and a lot of them don't exist anymore because the economics of living there, you know, the economics don't really work very well. And so, so much is, uh, remittances are a central part of the story in some of those places. So, so this was the person we knew um, about and we wanted to, to learn a little bit more about him. And, and so my father and I set out um, to, and, and, and you'll see he came from the, the jurisdiction near the city of Huayan. And Huayan is in the northern part of Jiangsu province in eastern China, so one of the poorer parts of a rich province in eastern China. And when you tell people you're from the Huayan area, the two things tend to happen. First of all, there's a glorious moment when they say, oh, you know, the former prime minister, the premier, Zhang Wenlai, is from there. And everyone kind of nods in this kind of celebratory moment. And the second thing that happens is the conversation tends to stop. Because beyond that, there's nothing particularly redeeming about this part of Jiangsu province. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, it, in Shanghai, the people from that part, um, they, they came to Shanghai late. They were kind of at the bottom of the ladder there. Um, you know, people speak about uh, people from what they call Subei, and, you know, often in pretty unkind ways. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not one of the most significant parts of China. It is along the Grand Canal, as, as you know, and how many of you have spent any amount of time along the Grand Canal in China? None. Uh, well, okay. Uh, so, I mean, this, this was a, um, like a lot of canals in the world that had its heyday um, before my great-grandfather was born. It was a kind of a central uh, conduit for, for uh, for China, and then like the Erie Canal in the States, it was superseded by more modern technology. And so the towns, you know, along the canals also, um, uh, you know, became less relevant over time. So the Tong Village is, is along here. It's still a bit of a, uh, you know, it's, it certainly is still a working canal, but doesn't have the significance that it once had. So my father and I are, are, are we're trying to ask if people know this place uh, because we asked the police station they've never heard of this place before and we go to the local government and they haven't heard of the place before because the only name we have for this village is a pre-communist pre-1949 name of the village that's kind of all we have to go on nobody's heard of heard of it before and uh, we spend the better part of a day kind of driving around uh, stopping and asking people if they've heard of this place before and and nobody does and if you've ever tried to find something in China before, you kind of know how this tends to go. Uh, very often the conversation ends with the phrase, bu tai qing chu, right? You, it, which literally means, you know, it's not very clear, I don't know. Uh, of course, it's a phrase that has great flexibility, right? So when somebody says bu tai qing chu, depending on the context, it can mean a number of things, including I don't know, I do know, but I don't want to tell you. It can mean um, uh, I'm, I'll get in trouble if I say anything. It can mean, you know, I, I'm ready for this conversation to be over. And so you don't really know unless you understand the context, uh, what, what really happens. And so very often you can have a conversation that goes around and around. It's 20 minutes of my life that I'm not going to get back. It ends in Putai Qingzhu and we're nowhere. So my dad and I didn't think we were going to find this place. And suddenly my assistant says, you know, um, I found a little uh, online, a small town 
where we think it still is. And uh, we went to this town and we found a person and we, we dropped the name of this, this old name of the village. The old name is Fu Ma Ying. And he said, oh, I think I heard about it, uh, but I know a guy. And, this, and my friend um, will be closer to it because he's lived here longer. So, so this first person kind of gets into the car with him and then we go pick up the second guy. And the second guy, you know, he kind of scratches his head and uh, he says, you know, I think so, but you know, I know a guy. So he gets into the van, and then we pick up a third guy. And then the third guy changes the whole dynamic of the van that we're in, because the third guy who gets in is the party secretary. So he is the, in this little, tiny, not very important place in China. He's, he's, he's one of the most important people there. And, and everyone seems to know that he's the party secretary, because it's like a priest has just walked into the car. I mean, it goes quiet, and there's kind of this irreverent pause, and the party secretary looks a little, that's him, he, he looks a little unusual. Um, and uh, in the end, he, and he's trailed by two of his, uh, his kind of confidants in, in this area, and we eventually find um, the Tong village, which is along a, a brick path. Um, and, you know, it looks like a pretty simple place. This is the path along, it's next to a creek where you know, it doesn't look like a place where you might want to wash your vegetables, but it is. And uh, so this is many years ago, so I'm with my, my much younger children walking there. And it is a, you know, it's not a hallmark moment uh, as far as a kind of embracing the place. It is uh, like a lot of villages around the world. Pretty simple structures, uh, brick houses, they, they grow uh, uh, rapeseed and other vegetables there. There are separate structures for cooking. Uh, separate structures for outhouses, um, and so kind of the, the, there's 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 no commerce. There's nothing to buy or sell in this area, so it's kind of out of out of the out of the way, and not much happens. Um, and and the, the the people there, so so the women gather for a photo. There's another photo of the men coming up, and like a lot of places, these are people who spent most of their lives outdoors, and uh, you can see it. I think you can see it on their on their faces. And what we do find in the village is, uh, so the man in the hat uh, greets us and starts to tell the story of my great grandfather. And he's talking to my dad. My dad's the one uh, in, who's got the red sleeves on. And he says, oh, this is great. You know, we know your great grandfather. And he starts to tell us the story that turns out to be partially true. Um, and and the, the, the basic part of the story of my great grandfather is that when he left around the turn of the century, he went to the place where kind of the, 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 the hub of modernity in Asia at the time was, and that was Japan. It turned out that he was a student, and he went on the public dole, and he went um, with a lot of leading intellectuals of the day to study in Japan. And you know, these are these kind of brand names in Chinese history, yes, Sun Yat-sen, and Lu Xun, and, and, and uh, uh, Kang Youwei, and, and uh, uh, you know these names. And he was there, and what, what, we, uh, what we heard, and then what I later confirmed was, so he was, uh, he was studying law, he was hanging out with some political revolutionaries, you know, he was part of this, this uh, then somewhat underground movement called Tong Meng Hui, the, the, uh, you know, the precursor to the, to the KMT in Japan, uh, which of course tried, you know, uh, several times before succeeding in toppling imperial China. And all this was true. What was also true is my great-grandfather in Japan, he married a Japanese wife, which came as a great surprise to his Chinese wife back in the village. Um, this, this happens, right? Um, so we, we learned all this, and, but the story that, that the, the man in the hat, who, who was the former party secretary in this place, was that it was a hero story, that, that your great-grandfather was a hero. Uh, when the Japanese soldiers came in 1940, uh, he spared the village, and, and uh, it was a great set of stories. What he, what he failed to mention, uh, and what we didn't know at the time, was that there were people very close to on the fa us on the family tree who, had, um, who were some of the poorest people in the village. And so this is my third cousin there. And before we left the first time, uh, he said, well, the next time you come, you eat at my house, and I'll tell you the real story. And I won't go into it except that what happened, uh, you know, long after my great grandfather left, was the power structure changed, and uh, the 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 scholars and the landowners who were kind of on our side of the family tree um, 
you know, the, the power structure flipped and they became some of the poorest in the village and had some of the least opportunities, and they're the people who are still there, uh, including him. And he, he died soon after I, after I got there. So what do I kind of take away from uh, a bit of this story there? It is, um, you know, this, this my great-grandfather was, you know, what some historians describe as part of, uh, part of China's Enlightenment generation when they interacted with these you know, these, these ideas of modernity that, that China, of course, came late to, came late to industrial modernity, these isms that we take for granted now, you know, Darwinism and capitalism and feminism and Marxism and empiricism, all of these things. Um, uh, he was one of these cultural middlemen, in a way, kind of interacting with these early ideas, these, these Chinese nationals who were connected to the outside world. And uh, you know, like a lot of countries, including this one, of course, you know, the, the long economic story has something to do with uh, I connecting with ideas and people from, from the outside. And, and uh, uh, my great-grandfather is a, is, is a uh, supporting actor in, uh, in that chapter of, in history. Uh, very briefly, one other person um, in that same Enlightenment generation is my maternal grandmother. And it, it turns out that she, so this is on my mother's side, and she went to a school, middle of nowhere, China, uh, a Jiangxi province in the city of Nanchang, and, and she went to a school run by American missionary women back in 1911. So someone decided, probably her father, that at the age of eight, her feet were going to be unbound. Her feet had been bound, and they were unbound. And she would be part of an early generation of girls to walk and run and read. And, and she chronicled her life in, in a lot of English language letters that she wrote to her American teachers at the time. Um, and this is her again. This is one of her ration coupon books that we, that we turned up. Uh, and she later went on to, uh, to Jingling, uh, one of the women, early women's universities in China. And these were some of the letters that, that uh, we turned up that she wrote to some of One of her teachers was from uh, Rome, New York on the Erie Canal. The other one was from Baltimore, Maryland. And she chronicled a lot of her, her, uh, her, her life there. And we learned that uh, she was part of certainly an elite group of young women who uh, they performed a Christmas carol by Charles Dickens. She became a pianist and she played in the Glee Club. They had a Glee Club in 1913. Uh, and she um, and they they read uh, Ibsen's *A Doll's House*, right? This defining uh, piece of feminist literature. And and she always we learned that she always wanted to come to the United States. Uh, a, a lot of this generation of women they eventually made it overseas. You know, certainly at the University of Michigan, there are certain there are celebrated women of this generation. Uh, my grandmother eventually did not make it. Um, but we, we learned a lot of her, her story from these letters and from others we, we spoke about. And, um, you know, her, her, her generation, her story, I think, is part of, uh, again, if we kind of think about continuities in, in Chinese history, there's a lot of attention to big turning points, obviously. But part of the continuity part of the story is, you know, these were, uh, you know, some of the early breakthroughs for women. Um, is what some of the historians, including ones here, um, uh, they, they tried to help me make sense of this kind of cultural hybrid generation uh, of, of women. Fascinating collision of women's stories because these American women at the time, uh, from reading some of the books that they wrote, you know, they were unsatisfied with the options they had in the United States at the time, kind of early 20th century. So they wanted to go for an adventure, and so church groups bankrolled their adventures to go to China. One of the teachers, uh, she wrote that when she was trying to get in, turn of the century China, you know, most of the foreigners were leaving because they were getting, uh, it was the, uh, uh, the Boxer Uprising, and, they, and so the foreigners were getting attacked and killed, and they're getting out, and she's going in uh, and looking for uh, this, this adventure in China. Um, so, um, and one kind of broader takeaway is, uh, you know, that, that kind of the longer Part of the China story, I think, is connected to the human capital story of uh, kind of investing in education that seems so obvious. Uh, I've certainly been to a lot of countries where that's not particularly obvious. And, and economic historians trying to tease out, well, you know, why, 
did China come to where it is? Uh, uh, many of you know the name Tom Roski. You know, at the center of these antecedents, as he talks about it, is the legacy of human capital. Um, Okay, I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stay on this for now. I just want to tell you stories of two more uh, folks in, in, the, in, in the family story um, who kind of illuminate this for me. So one of them is my uncle, my father's brother. So in 1949, um, my father is 10 years old, and uh, he was born on mainland, on mainland China. And he and his father got on a boat to, to go to Taiwan, and... And they got on a boat that, was, that sailed from Shanghai right after the one that sank. And I didn't know about this Chinese Titanic story before, uh, but the, the ship they almost got on, uh, called the Taiping, uh, it, it was a steamer, collided with a fishing vessel then. Um, just about everyone died. Uh, casualties on the order of the Titanic, 1,500 people. Uh, died uh, then with these refugees trying to leave mainland to go to northern Taiwan. Uh, my father had the great fortune, along with his father, to get to Taiwan. Um, but the person I was most interested for this was this, the brother who got left behind. Um, so uh, actually, two brothers got left behind. And one of them was my uncle, who I spent a lot of time when we were living in Shanghai to try to understand his story. Um, I, uh, he, he, he talked about uh, growing up uh, being politically stained because you know his father in Taiwan was connected to the losing side in the, in in uh, the the uh, Chinese Civil War and uh, the, the side that the Americans supported. Um, and uh, and and the phrase that he always pulled out when we were talking was "hai wai guan xi," yeah, overseas relations. So he was stained by overseas relations for the most for the first kind of thirty years of his life. Um, he was a great student, but not allowed to go to the best uh, schools there because of these these wrong political connections to you know to to counter revolutionaries. He talked about the famine and and in in some detail about how he would scrape off the bark from the trees and his mother would kind of marinate the bark a little bit uh, in order to soften it and and that's what they ate for a while. He remembers the story when he found a frog on the way home from school. Uh, this kind of great fortune of finding something to eat. Um, so uh, he, he told me about, uh, and he told me about the Cultural Revolution. The one tale, um, there are many, and you know a lot of them. The one that uh, he told a lot was, so his mother also got left behind. Uh, she wasn't taken. And because of her uh, connection to her husband, um, she was forced during the Cultural Revolution to stand under, in the winter, day like today, uh, under, underneath the tree so the icicles would drip down into her collar. And he remembers watching her. Um, it was on the school grounds. Uh, and she would stand there for, he says he stood there, she stood there for hours. You know, the Red Guards were there and forcing her to, to stand there. So um, in the end, his story is, one of a great, is a great redemption story. Because uh, when, when um, Mao dies and uh, the, ch the, the schools come back and they reinstate the college entrance examination, my uncle's 30 years old by then, um, and so he's one, and there are 10 years worth of kids waiting to go to college. Um, and he takes this test, and he aces it, um, and he becomes an academic, he becomes an engineer, he loves to talk about, you know, only 4% of kids pass the test that year, and I was one of those kids. He deserves it. Um, uh, what is... In the end, he, uh, like, like a lot of people of his generation, he had a number of jobs. You know, he was an academic and he was a consultant. And early on, he was a consultant to contract factories for Black & Decker. So he was a power tool <laughs> expert, uh, a factory uh, plant expert then. Um, and he, he has this great redemption story that I think uh, is part of a generation that saw a lot in Chinese history. And so after spending hours trying to understand his story at his dinner table in Shanghai, um, I, I was taking kind of the last of my notes and my uncle said, well, there's a lot of the story you can't tell. You can only tell the glorious parts. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like, how do I disentangle the glorious parts from the, uh, from the rest of the story? Um, and he said, well, you know, there are parts that are shameful and, and embarrassing uh, that you really, you really shouldn't tell. Um, 
And I came back and I said, well, this book is going to be published in English. You know, people in the United States are going to read it. So, and I also uh, decided that I was going to use, you know, he doesn't use the surname Tong anymore. He kind of stopped using it decades ago. So I was going to, you know, give him a, a bit of privacy and not use the name that he uses now. And he said, uh, and I said, but again, it's going to be mostly Americans reading this book. And he said, uh, well, that's a problem because I have friends in America. And I said, you have, you have friends in the United States? He said, how many friends do you have? And he says, six. <laughs> um, and, and that was the kind of push and pull lesson for me of, you know, there's a, there's a cost when, when you're trying to, to tell these stories. Um, certainly as somebody born here, I'm part of a generation that, you know, we, we value things like transparency. Uh, you know, we like restaurants with open kitchens. We believe in forgiveness and all these things. And a lot of that doesn't travel. Um, and, and that is the, the challenge. And so I'm kind of having this uh, conversation, uh, d debate. I'm kind of having an argument with my uncle about, you know, the value of his story. And it's really hard to have an argument in your second language, first of all, um, when you're trying to have this. And in the end, um, you know, we resolved it a little bit. And, and I decided that... Um, you know, he was one of the persons uh, who I know in my family tree who, you know, who ended up on the wrong side of history to some degree. Um, and when you're on the wrong side, nobody really tells your story. And so I decided I wanted to, uh, to tell his. Um, uh, his son, and, and I'll, I'll end on, on this, is my cousin. And, and that's him next to my dad. And I kind of cropped the photo that way because... He, he, he lives in Shanghai, he, he works, works at a General Motors plant, and he has a Buick. Uh, and that, that's kind of important to have in the frame here, because as you, as you may know, you know, General Motors and Buick have a certain brand cachet that it might have here. Um, but that was the only car he wanted to have, you know. Um, and, and his story is one that might be familiar to, to many of you. He, um, he does quite well. He, he is a... Uh, he's, a, he's the kind of manager at the plant where they assemble um, different kinds of General Motors vehicles in Pudong in the eastern side of Shanghai. Um, and he lives with his parents. He's in his 30s now. And, you know, because of property prices being what they are, you know, the multiples are far greater of somebody's income than they are here in the United States. There's no way he can afford his own property, uh, his own apartment. Unless his parents right, take, take their savings over multiple decades and, and, and give them to him, and they don't plan to do that. Uh, so, uh, in, and in the Shanghai, well, in the mainland marriage market, if you don't earn property, you know, that, that is a, that's a minus, right? Uh, certainly women are looking for a certain kind of financial stability, um, which is one way to put it. There are certainly other ways to describe uh, 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 the values <laughs> of women in China. The, the story about him that breaks my heart is um, he, he, we were having dinner and he talked about his girlfriend at the factory, at the General Motors factory, and she left him for one of his best friends who works at the plant, uh, who owns an apartment. And I said, Are, is that, you think that's the reason that's really the reason why. Um, and he said, I think that's the reason. Um, but, but what I want to kind of uh, end on uh, with my cousin is one summer when I went back to do some of this family research for, for, uh, for this project, he took me to a part of Shanghai I had not been into before, where uh, back in the 1920s, uh, the, 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 uh, the government, the uh, the KMT government wanted to construct a, uh, a government center in, in, the, in kind of the northern part of the city because they, they, they wanted to construct the, a Shanghai for the Chinese people. They didn't, want to, uh, they didn't want to use these old buildings along the Bund, along the river, as part of this neo-colonialist past. They wanted, to kind of, they wanted to start over. And he wanted to show me this um, because he always says, uh, you, know, you know, we... we Chinese, we Chinese are kind of conflicted. You know, on one hand, we, we want to connect to the outside world, but we also, it's important to, to remain Chinese. And he wanted to show me this particular building that was constructed then in the 20s, I think it was 1928 or so, um, that, that had, a, had a very kind of uh, 
imperial architecture, um, and it just it, it didn't look particularly Western. It looked more t even though on the inside it was it was designed by an American firm. It turns out, um, but it was it was a manifestation, kind of a picture of a aspiration of the Chinese people back in the twenties of uh, China for the Chinese people. In the end. Um, you know that that plan went uh, didn't go anywhere after uh, invasion and war and other things that never never came together. But what it reminded me at the time was some of the research I did uh, going back to my great grandfather at the turn of the century, and I think this has been a question that that Chinese people have been asking in so many different ways: is how do, how can you be how can you be modern and Chinese at the same time? And this. This dilemma, I think, this challenge um, has—it's uh, a question that the intellectuals and the scholars asked a, a century ago. I think it's still one that people are asking today. I just did a story this week about the Chinese stock market. On one hand, the Chinese economy wants to kind of be connected to the outside world and and have the benefits of globalization accrue to Chinese investors, but they still want to ring fence the market. Right, the Chinese stock market only two percent of the investment comes from. Uh, foreign investors is still kind of protected. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to protect it a little bit because they have they're conflicted about the outside world. Right when you open the windows, you let the flies in. Um, so I, I think uh, that kept coming back to me about this conflicted relationship that uh, uh, Chinese individuals and and China capital C have with the uh, with the outside world. It seems to me. That uh, in a lot of contexts, when we when we try to understand where China is in the world, obviously it's it matters a lot more than it did before in economic terms. Um, it is more, uh, you know, its posture is more aggressive than it was in the past. I think this tension is going to continue to uh, is going to continue to play out. Um, so finally, uh, a, a couple last. Um, Takeaways, and then I, I would love to, to have your, your, your questions. Is um, uh, you know what do I kind of take away? How do I think about China a little bit differently than when I started this uh, started this uh, this project? One of them is a, is a globalization lesson. My maternal grandmother, uh, the one who always wanted to come to the United States, um, so uh, when the communists uh, took over, and she. Uh, she had run a she had been running a school in Shanghai with her husband, and she left for for Hong Kong. Uh, but but her husband, my maternal grandfather, he kept going back and forth. As as you may know, this kind of corridor between uh, between Hong Kong and the mainland stayed open for a couple of years. It, it was it was certainly wasn't a sure thing that that the doors were going to close. Uh, so uh, so. Um, uh, th the way it did uh, after a while. So, um, and they thought the doors would stay open. My grandfather went back, and eventually he uh, eventually got arrested in 1951, uh, and it was arrested for being a collaborator. And that's a longer story, which I'm happy to, to talk about if anyone is, is interested. Uh, I went to the you know the prison in Shanghai where he was sent, and the labor camp in Qinghai where where he died. Um, but she assumed that uh, you know that. That these connections to the outside world would remain, you know that that, uh, and I think in my adult life, you know, I've thought about kind of globalization and borders as being less and less relevant too, until I was wrong. So she was wrong, she and her husband were wrong, um, and I think when we think about these connections, um, uh, very often, someone of my generation who's kind of lived through when I was in college, the Berlin Wall came down. And we saw the European integration, and we, you know, we thought borders were so, you know, 1985, um, and that it goes kind of one way, and and until it doesn't. And when we we were working on a series at Marketplace about globalization, and a lot of historians tell us, well, you know, maybe this kind of extreme globalization is the uh, is the exception rather than the rule in history. Um, and I think this that's a good reminder. And the lives of some of my relatives in China are a reminder that uh, sometimes, you know, there's a great human cost when countries uh, when countries close up. Um, so that was one one lesson I uh, I, I, I drew. Um, the other one is: um, Has anyone seen this elephant chart before? Uh, it looks a little bit like an elephant. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, that uh, the economist Branko Milanovic in, in New York, a former World Bank economist, has. Uh, uh, this is his chart. And it's a chart that, that puts into context what a lot of people call, call convergence. You know, and, and um, you know, the story that is, you know, in the kind of an early industrial revolution, maybe 15% of the people in the world really saw their quality of lives uh, increase substantially. Much of the rest of the world kind of stayed still, certainly including people in China. Um, and then, you know, that was this period of widening, of divergence, and now we've seen what a lot of historians consider, uh, economists consider convergence um, and, and narrowing of this gap, at least, at least among countries, at the country level. And so this is data from uh, uh, 1988 to 2008. So over that period of time, over those, those, those 20 years, um, uh, I, I, I really enjoy going back to this chart. Um, so what it is, it's a, it's a distribution of income of people in the world. So if you imagine everybody's income in the world and you plot it on this chart, um, you have the, you know, the zero percentile, uh, the people with the lowest incomes on the left and the highest incomes on the right. Um, and what's happened to, uh, to their incomes in this, uh, in this period of time, the last uh, you know, 20 years or so. And there are you know, a number of interesting points on the chart. Point B, uh, the 80th percentile, is uh, you know that is middle income uh, Europe, Japan, and the United States. So that um, perhaps helps to explain a little bit of uh, of how you know a certain level of economic angst has has showed up in a political way in much of the world. Um, but I want to focus on on point A. That's you know the 50, 50 something percentile. To some degree, they're the big winners of this period of convergence. And point A is, of course, uh, uh, middle class India, middle class China. Uh, so this is kind of this empirical way of describing how people's lives have become better. Uh, what I you know, try to do uh, by profiling some of, some of the people in the book is to put a little bit of flesh on this story, of this, this, uh, this convergence story. It's, it's a pretty, you know, it's a, a in some ways, a, a basic story of kind of a long catch-up that a lot of countries have. I still think it is a, a framing that helps as an economics reporter and as a business reporter to kind of understand, uh, you know, how far China has come and, and the challenges it still has ahead. So I'll stop there and ask for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, so we have about 20 minutes for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will run this mic over to you. Since we're recording it, please speak your questions into the microphone. So um, I, have a, I have, a, I guess, two questions. Um, they're both about things that you mentioned but didn't mm -hmm. elaborate on yet. So um, one question was, why did people not like this book? And it was, was it from the perspective of people like your uncle in Shanghai who didn't like that you were talking about things that were sort of mm -hmm. not glorious? Um, and then I wanted you to also elaborate on the, um, your grandfather who was um, ultimately arrested, I guess, during the Suppress the Counter-Revolutionaries right, yeah. campaign. Right, yeah, okay. Uh, so two significant haters have come out and, and commented <laughs> or found um, in the book. And one of them is, my, is one of my good friends of one of my, of my father's, uh, one of his classmates from Taiwan. And he calls my dad up after he reads the book and he says, I have two things to tell you. So first of all, I would never let my son read this kind of book. Uh, and and uh, the second is, you know, why did you allow your son to write this book? <laughs> Um, and so my dad said, my dad punts and he says, well, talk to Scott. <laughs> um, and I, I just spoke to him actually this, this past week and, and he, he phrased it, you know, it, you know he, he, he zeroed in on, on, on a couple of these embarrassing parts of history. So as, as part of the story of my uncle being left behind, my dad's brother, the rest of that story is their father, my grandfather, right? He left with his son and his mistress. Um, and that was the part that this uh, family of friends said, uh, you know, in a kind of a normal uh, Chinese cultural way. 
you know, that's very shameful, and we, we, we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't kind of mention that, and, and yet you insist on putting it in your book. Uh, so, and then you proceeded to ask me a few questions, but they were really, you know, questions masquerading as a lecture to me. Um, and uh, so it was, so first of all, I kind of dismissed it as, uh, and then I, I, I guess I, w it, what I thought about is that this is the, uh, I don't know if, I, I think there is just a, writing about these things, there's just a cost. Uh, in my view, I still believe that. I think the, um, the benefit of, of telling the story because it, it, it's central to the, to, to the person I'm trying to talk about and profile in this important part of history. Um, th there's a benefit to that, but um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a cost that not, not everyone, uh, when, you're, when you're telling these kinds of stories, right, not everyone is gonna look at the alternative is, is to leave it out, right? And, and people in my, uh, uh, line of work would, you know, might call that censorship. So, um, uh, but that's, I, I, I've been chewing on that uh, a lot. The, the other person who, who kind of found me on Facebook said, uh, well, you, you have this, uh, this clear, um, this clear ABC bias, right? And, uh, you know, of, of folks who, of my generation who were born here. Uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a good lesson not to, you know, th this is a, in, in my view, a, a a, a piece of the history, right? The warning not to not to generalize too much about my own uh, experience. Like a lot of Chinese Americans, though, um, our family histories include people who are these outward-looking Chinese nationals. And and when China was connected to the outside, they were the opportunists. And when China was closed, they were the prisoners and the scapegoats. Uh, and then when China opened up again, they they were once again the opportunists. Um, and it's the lesson is that's not the uh, certainly not the only part of the story, but you know in my view it, it's uh, it's a part of this economic story. Uh, my maternal grandfather was uh, in in 1940. Uh, he so they were living in Shanghai at the time. Um, uh, my grandmother and grandfather on my mother's side they're both from central China from Wuhan, you know just uh, uh, in the middle of the Yangtze River. And they got washed out by, by the flood of 1931, you know, the, the worst flood on record in the world. And they, like a lot of people, they ended up in Shanghai and started up a school there. And uh, so he, uh, he decided, and he had always uh, been somewhat political. He, he wrote in some of the letters that we, we found that uh, when he was in college, um, some of the, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the forces kind of loyal to the Communist Party. They took his, uh, you know, kicked his family out of uh, their property. Whatever the reason was, he decided in 1940 that uh, he had an opportunity to work for the Japanese occupation and to go back to his hometown and to take that job. And um, so he did that, and, and later on he was, he was uh, you know, captured, the records are found as a, as a collaborator. And so this, again, goes back to a really shameful, embarrassing part of the, the story. And one day I was with my mom in Shanghai. She came back with me for one of the research trips, and she said, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think this should be part of the part. This should be in, in, in the book. And so I said, okay. Right? I basically ceded a big red pen to her <laughs> and said, um, uh, okay. And, and, and then we started to collect information, which I found very, very interesting. And... Um, when I was here, uh, you know, I, I, I can, you know, Per Castle and, and Charles Bright pointed me to books on collaboration and how it imposes this moral map over, over a political story. Um, and what we learned about uh, this generation, uh, we, we went back to uh, Wuhan, the city of Hankou, one of the three cities there, and found a number of people who were in the same situation. They kind of told their stories and spoke to some economic historians who were uh, historians who were there. And we learned a few interesting things that made the story kind of more gray than, than we might have thought. Uh, you know, first of all, my grandfather went and he was part of the unit that was, uh, f that was uh, feeding the people there. Um, so uh, that was part of what, what he did, right? You know, occupation requires people to do these kinds of things. And this certainly was an opportunity for him to do this for his people. He could go back home and he, 
could take care of his mother, who was a widow, and his sister-in-law, who was a widow. So there was some family obligations. But what I found really interesting was when when historians said, well, you know, the the whole framing of collaboration is one where we think of uh, most people are resistors and there are a couple collaborators. And in this town, that wasn't the story. Uh, and, and he said, you know, in France and Vichy France, uh, they're, they're having a much more developed and interesting and nuanced and honest kind of conversation about what collaboration really looked like, um, but China's not really there yet. Um, and, the fin and, the, and the last thing that I found was um, when I went to the labor camp where we believe my grandfather was sent to in 1953, um, I, I was able to meet a number of uh, three survivors from that era. As you know, most, most of the prisoners sent did not, did not come back. My grandfather didn't come back. Uh, and they, they talked about uh, you know, what it was like being there, what it was like kind of living there through the famine and the, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the political meetings that, that they were forced to, to, to go through. And I think it, 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 it was a much more kind of nuanced story that it turned out a lot of Chinese families were trying to understand as I was going there too. Someone stuck me into the prison department and I was looking for records and the woman there said, you know, a lot of people are trying to, trying to understand this story now. Um, and you're not going to find any records, so I just suggest you just uh, you know, go to a mass grave site and collect some of the soil. Uh, and that's the advice I give people, and then you can kind of bring it back and symbolically you know, remember and bury uh, your, your relative there, which is what we ended up doing. Um, so in the end, uh, I, I was speaking to my mother about all this, and she said, well, you know, this is a story that a lot of Chinese families are trying to understand uh, and, and and trying to tell, and in the end, she granted permission. She said, well, you should put this in the book, so. Yes, please. Thank you. I uh, wanted to come back to, uh, with, to the story with which you began. So there was the story about you being up at the building and meeting this foreign businessman, right, of talking yeah. about sort of, you know, the skyscrapers are typically thought of this sort of like, this is sort of the rupture, this new China, right? The, um, and then you mentioned something about, you know, telling the story about generations of women to challenge such stories of, you know, the new and, and sort, of the, sort of the ruptures and moments of transitions that are often told as a story about capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, you to I wanted to hear a little bit more, if you could, talk mm -hmm. about how the story about women allowed you to, cha to change this and, or to challenge this sort of notion of ruptures by telling more a story of continuity, as you put it. Uh, um, well, I, I think there is, um, there's a lot of, as, as a reporter, you know, I'm one of these people who have, who, who are one of the constituents of big turning points. Right? That what we walk into work every morning and say, what's changed? And so I think, you know, this, this seeing history through these big moments, these rupture moments, these big turning points, emperors, presidents, wars, um, it, it's, for somebody like me, it's a very alluring way to understand uh, how, how things change over time, which, serves the interest of any government in power now, right? They, it, 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 it makes sense uh, for uh, any leader, any government, any ruling party to say, we built this. Um, so uh, in my world, I think that's a kind of dominant way to understand and to tell the story. Um, what I benefited from my time here was talking to folks who, who say, well, part of an undertold, an under, um, an undertold uh, way of understanding history is seeing continuities, you know, things that are, um, and what I knew less about uh, was, you know, there are a lot of serious scholars who, you know, who see what's happened in China since the reform as a, as a continuation of a process that began much earlier. You know, there are some who go so far as to argue that, you know, the, the Maoist period uh, was just an interruption, you know, in, in a longer period rather than a, um, so uh, what I took away from learning about my, my grandmother and the women's story was uh, you know, I, I, I went into a lot of history that, that kind of described uh, women of her generation who um, a lot of them in, in political terms, you know, they, they were in the historical record they were kind of rubbed out of the, 
you know, nudged out of the frame. Um, and yet, uh, they're, they're, they're a significant, I think, part of the, the early story. You know, it's a long women's story. Um, but a lot of these, these women, um, you know, they founded schools that still exist now in, in China. And the long story of, uh, of girls' feet being, being unbound, you know, that, that's part of the story. I don't want to kind of overdo it. But certainly, you know, these are some of the, uh, I think, continuities of, you know, some of the, uh, you know, this, the, the, the ideas of modernity, you know, these, these um, kind of these seeds that were planted on, on Chinese soil by Chinese people. Um, and uh, what, what I took away from that is, is I think, a, a part of history that I think a lot of historians know, you know, people on campus know, it was pretty new to me. And I think for people trying to understand, you know, where not just China but uh, other countries come from, you know, we, we need to kind of look beyond just these, uh, these big turning points. So, you know, that was the, that, that's one of my takeaways there. Alan. I wonder if you could tie uh, your family stories to the work you obviously did to make a living for several years in China uh, from the sustainability pro um, uh, perspective. And what I mean by that is, um, is there, can you relate your family and the way that different generations were in different parts of the country, mm -hmm. different, different thinking about the country. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking rural versus city. Uh, you, you so eloquently talked about the Chinese, the, the, the Chinese city within Shanghai as opposed to the international city. Mm -hmm. and, and can you then tie that to the modern issue of sustainability, consumption, industry, and how that varies among the, the, the primary cities, the secondary, the tertiary, the rural, et cetera, because there's so much change going on there. Yeah, uh, it's, th there, there was one rule of thumb that I, that I came across that I think is an oversimplification in a lot of countries that, you know, if, w once you pass per capita income of $2,000, the meat consumption goes through, through the roof uh, and people start consuming meat, which obviously has a huge uh, uh, footprint, you know, an environmental, environmental footprint. Um, I, I guess, you know, in, in, the, in the cities, um, as someone who's kind of been back in the States for a while, right, and, we, and, and certainly there are a lot of stories about, uh, I mean, uh, different kinds of pollution are still a huge issue there. I mean, this is, uh, air is, is one of the main stories that people talk about in, in northern cities like Beijing. Uh, water pollution is still, we think about our own history, you know, of Love Canal and that kind of thing. Well, um, you, you will still have paper mills, you know, ringing lakes there and kind of dumping the sludge into the water. There was a story about um, uh, dead pigs being found in waterways near, near Shanghai. Um, when I kind of step back and, and look at some of the, the numbers of, um, say, with, with uh, the carbon footprint, it's still on a per person basis. And maybe this still gets to where China is still getting to. You know, it still, uh, still pales in comparison to countries like, like this one. To be sure, um, uh, because China is still growing at, you know, 6 7%, and its consumption is going to, you know, the, the patterns that that um, countries like China and India develop are are critical, right? Vehicles and transportation and energy and what kind of energy they, uh, you know, where their elect electricity comes from. I mean, these are important decisions being made, being made now. Um, to me, I think, uh, at least from here, uh, living in a town where China can get so scapegoated for for things, would I? Uh, what I, I think remind myself is is kind of on a per person uh, footprint basis. You know, it's it's not a great story, but uh, the the Chinese footprint is 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 uh, you know certainly not what it is here. Hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. Really appreciated it. Um, so, uh, in the responses and then throughout the story, um, I, I heard um, education of different family members coming back up and as a source of maybe 
continuity or interruption. I kind of noticed that. So I was wondering, um, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about the role of education in your family um, in the past and, and also perhaps more broadly is in a sense of a global footprint, um, certainly uh, Chinese people engaging in the higher education sphere is something that we see a lot of here at the University of Michigan. So, Yeah. Um, well, maybe taking the second, second uh, uh, part of your question first, um, you know, when I, it might have been 2014, I went back to Shanghai and was doing some of the research for this, and I went back and, and met my, my old land, landlady, uh, you know, kind of a wealthy woman uh, from Shanghai, owns, owns um, a lot of property, and she said something kind of revealing. She said, of all my friends in this circle of, you know, of, of elite mainland Chinese people, um, all of us have either our money or our children abroad, mostly in the United States. So I, I think this is, um, uh, on one hand, um, we see the Chinese government right, trying to um, um, reverse the brain drain and, and bring uh, bring people back, and it's putting some controls on 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 uh, overseas investment, right? The, these the, these uh, acquisitions that big companies make, you know, for different kinds of reasons. But at at, a, at an individual person level, I still see the when you you know you know a little bit about the Chinese education system, and and think about you know what 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 will make the uh, what parents think. Will be the best opportunities for their for their children. I, I still see um, the 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 impetus for uh, for uh, you know going out. I think Chinese a lot of Chinese people, in my view, are very kind of open and honest about you know what they what they have and what they still need to uh, right still still need to understand as China. You know there are a lot of great. Um, uh, Chinese companies and entrepreneurs, you know, uh, gaming companies, billion-dollar companies, that that do fantastic in the domestic market, uh, and, st and trying to you know and 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 understanding the peculiarities of the Chinese economy, right, and the role of the state, um, and and trying to to connect with the outside world, trying to understand you know the the, the rules. Um, one belt, one road. I think is an example of that too. I, I think it's this is still uh, this push and pull of uh, trying to trying to uh, you know understand you know what trying to take lessons that for obvious reasons you know were learned in a in a Chinese context and 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 uh, and seeing if they apply in in these other countries. And I think at the individual person level, right, the people who who understand these these kind of principles and and uh, can go back. Have a great advantage still. I think. I mean, there are a lot of jokes about the, you know, this, the, the students who go back and can't. You know, my old assistant was, you know, she was consistently teased as well. You went to Canada. You have these great opportunities, and how come you haven't become, you know, wealthy? But to me, I think the impetus is still one that uh, that that makes sense. I guess uh, to to me, um, education. Um, you know, I, uh, it's certainly been a central part of the, the, the story in my family. For some reason, you know, uh, my great-grandfather, born in 1878, you know, decided uh, that he was going to, you know, try to be a scholar that was somewhere in the family history. And when we found some of the documents in Japan where he went to, you know, went to college, Waseda University, uh, it was on the public dole. So some students were kind of private paying students and, and uh, uh, he, was, he was either paid you know, at the national level or the provincial level, you know, public money, government money uh, paid for him to go. And that has been uh, something that, that's been a story kind of throughout certainly my family's history. Uh, my maternal grandmother was eight years old. I think if she had a brother, she probably wouldn't have had the opportunity, but she was an only child. And, and we don't know who, but somebody decided that she was going to go to a school, you know, run by a bunch of American women, uh, American missionary women. So, you know, these antecedents are there uh, somehow. And I asked my, um, 
my uncle who, who lived and suffered in the 50s and 60s. And I said, well, did you always still have a sense that you, ca you, know, that you came from a, a family of scholars? Was that something you felt was still, was still in you? And he said, well, certainly. You know, I, I knew that that was, uh, uh, was part of the past and something I needed to do because for 10 years, right, there were no returns to education. It didn't really make sense uh, for, uh, for people to just still think about the returns to, to going to school. So um, it, it certainly is something that, that was, uh, th that's always been there. And in a lot of countries, it's not always there. You know, it's kind of taken for granted in a lot of Chinese families, well, that everyone does that. But, they, you know, certainly in, you don't hear that in Venezuela. I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, what was it like um, being a journalist from the U.S. working in China? Um, and were you, did you make it clear that you are a journalist when you were doing research for this book? And do you think you encountered any self-censorship or resistance? I did not. Based on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was a, a strikingly different relationship uh, going back as a, uh, you know, as a grandson of China. Um, than working as a as a foreign reporter, you know, often as a you know as a as a as a foreign journalist, it can, it is not a it can be a challenging relationship. It's often an adversarial relationship, um, especially dealing with uh, public authorities and local governments. When I went back and said, "I'm just you know this is my," <laughs> and I would flash these documents that hopefully would make people excited. Oh, this is my 1948 passport of my grandmother, and uh, you know 1946 ID, Nanjing City ID, of my uh, of my great grandfather. Um, and I'm trying to kind of understand this story. So I'm playing the Confucius card, right? The Confucian card, and it worked because I think um, it was a, it was a, in general a very different relationship as far as people who are willing to to try to open their doors to help. I don't think as a reporter I, I, in, in Northwest China where the, labor, where the labor camps were, most of them are shut down, as you know, um, I would have got very far uh, as a reporter trying to understand this. But when I had somebody in my family who was there and uh, you know, people gave me really good suggestions and advice and contacts, and it turns out that the, um, it's now a city where the labor camp is, it's the Los Alamos of China. They have nuclear weapons testing there. So foreigners aren't supposed to go. <laughs> and and uh, so one person who used to work in the prison department said, well, don't try to buy a train ticket because they're not going to sell you one because you, as a foreigner, you're not allowed to go. Don't try to get a hotel room because you're not going to get a hotel room there. So, you know, here are two of my friends who will uh, uh, who will kind of help you there. You have to take the bus, which takes nine hours, but that's what you have to do. Um, but it, it was, uh, you know, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, it can be uh, challenging to, to operate there. And to me, for obvious reasons, you know, there's not always a very high level of trust, uh, people from the outside, but it was, uh, it was very different. Um, you know, you, you kind of see the, um, you know, don't, don't always see a softer side. Uh, as a as a journalist there, but I saw it when I was working on this project. Thank you very much.